when Jesus comes into your life, one of the things that happens to you is you go, it both makes sense of and explodes the sense that everything else used to make. <laughs> do, you, do you understand? Yeah. I mean, it makes sense of the world, and then, and then everything you thought you knew is exploded. And, um, and so it is. And particularly those of us uh, who are Americans, and I'm very well aware that in this church we're not all Americans. Um, but right now we're, we're struggling with politics. And these politics are kind of eating us up. I don't know that I remember... Having been a child of the 60s, I would say to you that the political environment right now is is at least as volatile, maybe more volatile than it was in the 60s. And, and so let's do this. Let's talk about the kingdom of God this morning and let's have in our mind the body politic. So let me give a few words. That's actually not my new slides. Um, let's, let's, um, although I might have sent you the same one, who knows? I can do it, I can do it without a slide. So let me start with the introduction that I want to give, which, which is to, is to talk to you about the wisdom of God. Um, are we good? That is what came off the email? Hallelujah. Then let's not worry about it. Don't worry about it. I promise you I've got it here. In James chapter 3, okay, so you know what I'm going to do? Of course you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray. <laughs> okay, so Lord, help me to pay attention. <laughs> me. There you go. And Father, I ask that you'd open our eyes and give us wisdom this morning. And that in Jesus' name, the, your presence would be manifested among us. And we want the wisdom that is from above. Listen to what James says about wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast or be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. That's God's wisdom. Can you believe that's God's wisdom in a political season? Um. When the political season started this year, I, I purposed to stay out of the rancor, and you know, it's been hit and miss. <laughs> you know, it's been hit and miss. Um, and and it, it's, it's really hard not to get swept up. What's interesting to me is that everybody thinks they're reasoning with the wisdom of God. All right. But I'm going to tell you, the wisdom of God is so radical and so strange and so different that the truth is you should say, I hope I'm reasoning with the, reason, with the wisdom of God. And then submit it to him and wash it through what he has done. And then don't be, don't be surprised if you're surprised. When you're angry at someone, do you tend to think with God's wisdom? When you're afraid of a situation, do you tend to think of God's wisdom? When you're a partisan, are, are you, do you tend to think with God's wisdom? Yeah, right. In fact, um, when we actually think something is right, I didn't say true, I said right, then, then we only actually listen to things that reinforce our bias. And this is a big, big problem. And um, so we're a mess. And there's a lot of wisdom around right now that is, that is not the wisdom of God. It also is not the ways of God. And you know this, that God said his ways are not our ways. And we, ought, we say that, we quote that, and then, and then we go, oh, we have such a hard time following that. Why do we have a hard time following that? 
I think it's because, as the psalmist says in Psalm 77, when the waters saw you, O God, in verse 16, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. I love this. I love this personification of the waters. The waters were afraid when they saw God. Indeed, the deep trembled, the clouds poured out water, the skies gave forth thunder, your arrows flashed on every side, the crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind, your lightning lighted up the world, the earth trembled and shook. This poetry is magnificent, guys. Your way was through the sea, your path was through the great waters. Now, when we hear that, we immediately think of the Exodus, but listen to what it says. Yet your footprints were unseen. I joked last night about that old poem, you know, about the footprints in the sand and everybody says that was God. I'm like, nope, you can see those. (laughs) If his footprints are in the sea, now you got it. Remember Jesus walking on water and he says, Peter, come on out here. And Peter does it. But his footprints are in the sea and the mystery of that is you can't follow those kind of footprints. But this is what he says and this is what the psalmist says about him. Your way was through the sea. And then last verse, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. So he is talking about the Exodus. The most counterintuitive thing happened. He said, we're leaving, we're leaving tonight, we're gonna take our stuff. Anything you can't carry with you, you can't, is not going, we're going. And then you come to a sea. And Jesus leads you through it. Now I'm telling you this because I promise you, many of you are faced with bigger things than who to vote for. Ah, now we're talking. We do have the idea that somehow if we vote for the right person, things will get better. Being old is helpful. (laughs) Because my whole life, every election I've ever heard, this is the most important election of our lifetime. And we only say that because the last one didn't turn out the way we thought. I have the wonder of being a child of the 60s. If if you haven't studied the 60s, I'm telling you, it it was just an insane time. The world was falling apart. All the systems were failing. Riots, wars. We we hated each other. Generations hated each other. All kinds of things. And, and And I had, 1972 came, and I got saved in August and made my first vote in November. And I voted for Richard Nixon. Well, I did good, didn't I? (laughs) See, the political spirit is still here. I'm pretty sure you can't do worse than I did, but some people, but this morning when I was debriefing it, everybody said, no, we probably can. And that's what politics does to us. And so what I want to do is how do we think about the ways of God in a time like this? And when I think about the ways of God, they're so, they're so counterintuitive. They're, they're, they, they take us where we don't expect to be. So they come out, the children of Israel, they come out into the wilderness. And when they come out into the wilderness, they find themselves in this moment in Exodus chapter 15, verse 22. When, then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Then they came to Marah, and they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, they named it Marah. It was meaning bitter waters. And the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? And he cried to the Lord. And listen to this. The Lord showed him a log. Do you guys know what a log is? A dead stick. A big one, a very big one. He showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. The first water filters in the Bible... A dead stick thrown into the waters so that everyone could drink sweet waters. This is the wisdom of God. What party would have voted for that? (laughs) Please help me with this. Then the Lord made for them, and I love this, a statute and a rule. Can you say rule? Rule. Now we're all going to be rule followers this morning. There he tested them saying, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes and give ears to his commandments and keep his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians for I am the Lord your healer. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I'm, do, do you understand 
that I'm saying to you that his, what we think is right. Not one of us would clean water that me, by that method. Now, you're only thought here that's working inside of you here is that you think, well, that was cool then, but he's gone absent on us. Okay, right. There you go. You're actually at church. You might be saved. My job might be easier than I thought. And so then I say, if you want to see God's politics, read Psalm 2. What does Psalm 2 say? It says that the nations rage and they say, we will not have him to rule over us. And God goes, well, that's cool. He laughs. And Psalm 2 is, a, is, a, is, is the son and the father in revealing themselves. So listen, we are living in the world of Psalm 2. The nations are raging. Oh, by the way, if you don't think that America is just like all the other nations, you're really not paying attention. Just go to any nation in the world and ask them what we're like. I, I can hear you. I can hear the immigration talk coming from you. It's just rumbling, 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 rumbling. rumbling. <laughs> I get it. Listen, this is a very special country. There's a lot of very special things about this country. A lot of amazingly special things about this country. But when it comes to the body politic, we're not that special. We don't want God to reign over us. Now, go ahead and say it. Some of us do. I do. Don't you want God to rule over us? I do. I do. I get it. 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 So then the question comes, how's that going to happen? God's only plan for his reign over us is the kingdom of God. All right. How's that going to work out? Let's look at this thing. Let's look at the inauguration of the kingdom of God. In Matthew 11... I'm getting the same result I got last night. <laughs> People leaving. Anyway, from the, <laughs> I, hurts my feeling. I don't think it's your bladder. I think it's my mouth. <laughs> from, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. What? He, look, he puts a date on this thing. John came preaching. And from that time, the kingdom suffered violence. And then he says, and, violent, and the violent ones take it by force. Now, this is an interesting verse. I'm not going to spend much time here, but it's interesting because, because here's, here's what it seems, to, here's what a lot of people say. Every time, every time this verse is read in a charismatic meeting, man, charismatics get happy. Because it's read this way. It's, it's read, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcing its way in, and men of force are trying to grab it. Something like that. And so what we take it, we take it that this violence is kingdom violence. But on the practical reality, from the days of John the Baptist, this is next, until now the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. There's two possible meanings of this. Because so, well, you say, well, I'm not following you, Pastor. Well, you'll follow me here in a minute. When John started preaching, you know what happened to him? He said the kingdom of God is here and he became the victim of violence. And violent men are trying to take it by force. Some people think it means that the people of the kingdom meet that violence with an equal and opposite violence that's spiritual and good. Well, that's a tortured way of seeing the context, but it's possibly true. It is possibly true. I'll, I'll allow it. The more likely thing is that more violence is coming because violent men are trying to destroy the kingdom. And in this thing is a seed saying the kingdom does not come by the kind of violence that human beings think. 
The kingdom does not come that way. All right, now think for a minute. John the Baptist rose as a prophet after no prophets for years. He arises, they say, hey, there's a prophet among us. He's down by the Jordan. He's preaching and he's baptizing converts. Now we don't, we think that's religious stuff. What you don't understand is they thought that was political stuff. John the Baptist is down by the river preaching and baptizing. That is, he's gaining followers by baptizing them and they now become John's followers. So we have a brigand out there and he's gathering cohorts. Now you say, you think that you think that's not true. Well, really, then why did they go get him? Because he was actually even confronting Herod for Herod's way of life. He was indicting him, much the same way our political leaders are. He's indicting him for his immorality. Oh, where did we get that from? (laughs) And when he was doing that, Herod, inspired by those that are with him, that are the victims of his accusations, takes him by force and imprisons him and commits violence against him. Look what Jesus did. Now, when he heard that John had been arrested, this is Matthew 4.12, he withdrew to Galilee. For most of us, we don't get this. Jesus is there in the same area where John is. Jesus has been baptized. And now Jesus is gathering his own followers And Jesus hears about John being arrested, and he leaves. Why? Straight up, folks, reality. He got out of the heat of the moment. Was he a coward? No, he's not a coward. His hour had not yet come, but if he had stayed right there in Jerusalem, the likelihood is that the same kind of thing that came against him, against John, would come against him. He withdrew to the sticks. You worry about a big problem that's going on in Washington, D.C., but you're not that concerned about dimming New Mexico. <laughs> Do you get it? So he goes to a place where the heat is not on. But notice this. What did John do? John preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what John preached. If you go see John's first preaching, it was repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and then baptized. This is the same thing as, as registering voters and gaining, gaining allies on your team. He was recruiting and enlisting people. He was telling them, change your mind and come be on this side. Now Jesus is doing it. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. From what time? From the time he withdrew to Galilee. Now, what I'm trying to get you to see is we have so thought that that all this stuff is spiritual that we've missed how loaded with politics it was and how on the ground it was nasty stuff. And if I were a professor in a school and I were a cynic, I would just reduce this to a political rebellion that that turned into some religious fanatics creating a religion. Does happen. I want you to think realistically about this stuff, and I want you to get. I want you to feel it this morning. I want you to feel it. Because you know what I want to do? I want to turn the religious spirit up in his house and then soak it because it's a snake. And the political spirit is its twin. And I want it to be deader. All right. Are we doing good? Are we friends? All right, friends. All right. So far, we're friends. I mean, you... <laughs> so far. <laughs> I love my church. <laughs> now, when Papa Jack was here, he took us this passage. This passage. Matthew 6, 33. Guess what? Guess when Matthew 6 was preached and where? It was preached when Jesus went to Galilee. And in the context of all, all of this stuff, 
And so then Jesus stands up and he has a multitude, thousands, and he, and he preaches to them the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he gives us this, this verse that we all know. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Somebody say, what things? What things? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. What's the context? The context is food and clothing. Why am I telling you this? Because I want you to understand something. The kingdom of God is not a religious frame of mind. It's not otherworldliness that gives us a myth to go live in so we don't have to live in the now. Jesus was saying to them, he was saying that to consider the birds and to consider the lilies, and he was saying to them that they were provided for and they were cared for, and he was saying, in the kingdom of God, it's true of you also. For the Gentiles, verse 32, the one that comes before 33, seek after all these things in your heavenly Father, knows that you need them all. <clears throat> Said the robin to the sparrow, I would really like to know why these anxious human beings rush around and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. practical. My life in Jesus is very practical. I have a real father and he knows me and he knows my needs and he's not absent. And the kingdom of God says, seek the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Seek the rule of God. Where can you seek it? Well, the easiest place you can seek it is here. And when I seek the kingdom of God, you know what? The anger that I have, the plans that I have for you in anger change. When I seek the kingdom of God, the plans that I have for us in fear change. When I seek the kingdom of God, there's actually an outcome that's different. So the kingdom of God is practical, and oh, by the way, it's unfolding. In Hebrews chapter 12, the book of Hebrews was written about, um, what, 30-something years after the death of Jesus. And what had happened was a bunch of Hebrew people, that is to say Jews, were converted and were following Christ. And in following Christ, guess what happened? They slowly got kicked out of the trade unions. They slowly got kicked out of the marketplaces. They so slowly lost their jobs. They slowly got marginalized, and they sl slowly were being persecuted and, and pushed out. And this, this was a very real thing that happened in the years following Christ. As long as the body of Christ was not perceived as threatening to the common life of, of, of Israel, they sort of lived in a little period, a little tiny period of peace. But as soon as the threat posed by this Jesus party was perceived in Jerusalem, the persecutions came. And these Hebrews, these Jews who had embraced Jesus, but are in the process of losing their, 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 their place, they began to consider defection. And the writer of Hebrews, which uh, some people like to say is Paul, I'm more and more convinced it was Luke, but we'll do that another day. The writer of Hebrews is writing to them and saying, uh, you, you don't want to leave this Jesus. And at the apex of his argument, he, he exhorts them to keep their faith while acknowledging their suffering. And then he goes on to say, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken 
and thus offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. There was a context. I tell you that the, this was the potential apostasy that there was, but there's another context. The writer of Hebrews goes on to say there's a shaking coming. And I think he was specifically talking about the Jewish wars that were coming. But he says, but we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. I want to tell you something. I too will be out of the country, by the way, uh, during the election. I'll be in Mozambique on, on election day. I've been delivered. I'm being raptured. <laughs> let, let me tell you, no matter what happens on that Tuesday, you are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. It will not be shaken by this election result. So listen, please go and post all your partisanship and then post an affirmation that your faith is unshaken. You know what that'll do, by the way? That'll make your pre the previous part of your post less rancorous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm doing my best to abstain from myself during the political season. I almost fell down. And it wasn't the Holy Ghost. All right, let's go further. Let's go further. We're, we're further along than you think, but this is so fantastically amazing. This stuff, this stuff blows my mind. When I study my Bible, it just blows my mind. And every, when I study my Bible, it takes me out of my anxiety. So Pilate, this is in John chapter 18. Because what happened was Jesus ministered a while up in Galilee and Jesus came to the time that he said, okay, now we're going to Jerusalem. And oh, by the way, during Jesus' ministry, he was even wroth to go to the feast in Jerusalem. Uh, he even one time said he wasn't going and then he went. Because he didn't want to be a public person in those moments. He didn't, he didn't want to be known in those moments. I had a lot of my friends tell me that, that they slipped off and went down to Lakeland when the revival was there. But it's, I was surprised at how many of them said, yeah, I kind of sat in the back. I didn't want to become the issue. I wanted to see what was going on. Anyway, so, so Jesus, uh, he doesn't actually go back to Jerusalem until that time comes when, he, when it says that, that uh, the hour has come. You ever notice that when you're reading your Bible? My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. Then he says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And then he goes to Jerusalem and he does these odd things. He does, he goes, in, he goes into Jerusalem as, as Steve was alluding to. He goes into Jerusalem and he allows them to give him a parade. And in the parade, they're saying, Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were saying, save us. Save us. Save us. Like a political rally, like a convention. <laughs> and they were in the streets. And again, now they're, not, now they're not off in Galilee. That problem has come here. It's here. You should have seen the crowd Hosanna, save us, save us. And he lets them do it. And they call him king, but there was a king. There was a king. There was a king in the Herodian dynasty. I want you to know something. Kings get insecure. Kings don't, don't let... <laughs> I remember the first time I went to Haiti. Uh, some of y'all might have heard of Papa Doc Duvalier, who was, had a dictatorship in, in, in Haiti. And, and he was followed by Baby Doc Duvalier, who was, who was the, basically the emperor of Haiti when I was there. 
Well, when you were there, what you, here's what you heard about. Every time somebody rose up in that little small nation, every time somebody rose up that had any kind of political power, they disappeared. <laughs> I, was in, I was in Zimbabwe, and I thought I might disappear. <laughs> Jesus is in Jerusalem, and again, a political thing has happened. They have declared him to be the king. And so, along and along, he's arrested. And when he's arrested, you remember, do you remember his disciples? They, they decide to, that one little brief, they're going to fight. And w- w- one person gets their ear cut off, and Jesus heals a cut off ear. And then Jesus says that he was going to go with them because he looked at them. He looked at those who came to get him, and he said, this is your hour and the power of darkness. Oh, how that phrase has branded into my mind. And they took him, and then he went through a night of trials, Caiaphas, Herod, Pilate. And so in John 18, so Pilate entered the headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? He answered, and I love this, do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me? All you who have questions for Jesus when you get to heaven, don't do that. (laughs) Just don't. (laughs) Just don't do that. Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus said, my kingdom's not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom's not of this world. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. Now Jesus is talking kingdom talk. Let me tell you what people understand about how kingdoms come. They understand that kingdoms come at the edge of a sword, or as we would say, at the barrel of a gun. 200 years before Jesus, a king, a man had arisen of the Maccabean family and he overthrew by sword the Syrians and the people made him king and there was a brief Maccabean dynasty in Israel where the Jews had their own, their own dynasty. But of course, Judas Maccabeus and, and his kin, they were, they were not of the royal family, not of the prophetic royal family. And then just 30 years before Jesus was born, Herod the Great aided the Romans and defeated the dreaded Parthians in a battle. You don't know, you have ever do any study. The Romans dreaded the Parthians because those guys could ride horses and shoot and, and shoot arrows. You thought that was only in the Wild West. <laughs> and and Herod defeated them. As a reward, they gave him a kingdom. Now, this is just where, from where Jesus is. This was just 60 years earlier. Now I'm in my 60s, and I realize it was a blink. It was a blink of time. And now a king has been announced, and there's only one thing to do with this. You don't, you didn't, in those days, you didn't get to defeat a little uh, uprising by an election. You, you put it down by the sword. And Jesus comes and says, he says this strange thing. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. Now, I want to tell you what he did mean and what he didn't mean. He didn't mean my kingdom is other worldly in the sense that it is spiritual and not here. Oh no, he didn't mean that. His kingdom would be in the spirit, but it would be here. Absolutely here. When he says my kingdom is not of this world, he does mean this, it won't come at the edge of a sword. Now, please understand, 
If you think like we think, if you think with the wisdom we think with, then Jesus would have said, Pilate, let's sit down, let's reason this thing out. If you understand the kind of kingdom I'm, I'm trying to propose, it's no threat to you at all. Yeah, he didn't do that. He didn't do that because listen to me, the kingdom of God is a threat to every rule and power and throne and dominion. There is not one that it does not threaten. And oh, by the way, if Christians are simply made into a voting block, we've missed the point. Because this kingdom is subversive, but it gets into everything. It gets everywhere. And you can't kill it out. And so Jesus says, oh, you don't understand. If my kingdom was the kind you're worried about, oh, they'd be fighting. They're not fighting. Here's another way of saying it. My kingdom isn't the sort that grows in this world, replied Jesus. If my kingdom were this world, my supporters would have fought to stop me being handed over to the Judeans. It's not like that. My kingdom isn't the sort that comes from here. So listen, he's saying violence won't establish it and violence won't maintain it. Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, I love it. Well, you say that I'm a king. <laughs> for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world to bear witness of the truth. By the way, understand that the world as it's used is speaking of a system that is not from God. It's a system that's upheld by demonic wisdom. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Okay. Now, hear the echo for me. Hear the echo with me. I set it up for you earlier. Everyone, everyone, whew, who is of this kingdom, they listen to my voice. Everyone who is of the truth Say truth. truth. Listens to my voice. Are you listening to Jesus? If not, let the fresh wind blow on you again. Go immerse yourself in the Sermon on the Mount and just let his words wash over you again. Pray, Lord, I want to hear you. Listen. After he said, um, Pilate said to him, what is truth? Now let me tell you how we think. We think truth is a mathematical formula or a chemistry formula or a set of rules we can stick in our pocket. It isn't. It's a person. It's a person. A person came who is the truth, who is everlastingly the truth. And he stood before Pilate, and Pilate said, what is truth? And he had a sneer in his voice. He says it as a man who knows that before him stands one who threatens him but doesn't understand how or why or what or where. And after he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and listen to what he does. He preaches the gospel. Pilate preaches the gospel. Listen to what he said. I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at Passover. So who do you want me to release to you? The king of the Jews. And they cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, I love this text. This text says, now Barabbas was a robber. Now, listen, that's not really true. He was, as I said earlier, a brigand. More likely, he was a terrorist, what we would call him today. He was a member of a, listen, subversive group. 
He was, a, he was on a watch list and he was actually arrested for crimes. He was a known troublemaker. He was a known problem. But Pilate preaches the gospel. I'm gonna give you a man. It was the Passover. One man will suffer. The rest go free. And so Jesus is nailed to a cross and that is the truth. And that is how the kingdom comes. And that is why the writer of Hebrews, when he saw the Hebrew people suffering for his name, said, no, 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 don't miss it. You're, you're right in the middle of this unshakable kingdom. And you still do have a father who knows what you need. And sometimes that father will allow them to take the bread from your plate and sometimes he'll allow them to take your head from your shoulders because we're following the one who hung on a cross and his kingdom does not come by the violence of those who support his kingdom but by violence against those who are in his kingdom. The kingdom of God does not come by force. It does not come, it won't come by elections. But one of these days, our God We'll throw a dead stick because he did <laughs> into the waters of human bitterness. <laughs> because his wisdom is not of this age. <laughs> and so I tell you, participate in the political process, but be astonished when it doesn't produce the outcomes of the kingdom of God. Because you and I, you and I produce the outcomes of the kingdom of God by laying our lives down in the world we're living in so that kingdom can come in families. Kingdom can come in our church. Kingdom can come in our city. Kingdom can come to some people who don't have bread, to some widows, to some orphans, so that kingdom can come. Because his ways are not our ways. This is the kingdom of God and this is the glory of God and this is the one we're following. Stand. Now, I just want to say very quickly, if you are needing heavenly wisdom for, 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 a, for a body of water that's threatening you, come for prayer. Come now, come for prayer. You'll understand my imagery. If you are standing at a place in your life and fear and anger are threatening you and you don't know what to do, come to the water and find his footprints. Come, let us pray for you. Let us lay hands upon one another. I'm just like you. I, my life is full of things that I say, Lord, I can solve this and this and this. Why can't I solve this one? And we cry out to God. He is our deliverer and our king. Oh, come Holy Spirit. Come and pour yourself out on your people. Come and hear us as we pray this morning. Come and meet with us. Ministry team, come very quickly. You don't have to hear the problem, but you can just pray for the wisdom of God and for the mercy of God. Now, if you're here this morning, you say, you sound very strange. Let me tell you something even stranger. If you will believe in the name of Jesus, he will forgive your sin. He will come into your life and he will put you in a kingdom that is never going to be shaken. If you will give yourself to Jesus Christ, he will bring you into purposes that you never even dreamed. I could not imagine my life when I was a 17-year-old, angry, confused, frustrated kid. But someone told me about Jesus. And I knew about him enough already, and I just wondered, can he do this in my life? Can he? And I cried out to him one night, and in my despair, the heavens opened. 
And then he brought me on this adventure. My life has never been the same. It never will be the same. That was the defining moment. And Jesus went into the bitter waters of my soul and made something that's worth, that can be drank, that you can drink. If you need to give your life to that Jesus, come give yourself to him. And for crying out loud, go find a peaceful place in this political season and quiet yourself and say, oh God, help us, help us. We don't know what to do. And the more you're convinced that you do know what to do, probably the less likely is you do. Lord, step into these lives. Lord, let it come that there are, there are testimonies and witnesses of how impossible was the situation, but God came and heard my cry. Father, how is it that in the, in the wisdom of heaven, the death of Jesus could bring so many amazing, beautiful things? How did you heal the world? By nailing him to a tree. Now we live in this world and we long for, Lord, we long for the kingdom of God. For the beautiful things of the kingdom of God to be manifested here on earth as they are in heaven. Disease is defeated. Fathers reconciled to their children. Marriages that look like the bride of Christ with her bridegroom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you've suffered an injury and you live with residual effects that will not heal, let us pray for you this morning. You've had an injury, a physical injury. Maybe a broken bone or joint or maybe a surgery that was botched and you're suffering pain and trouble and it will not heal. Let us pray for you. Okay, over here, over here. Come on, I need some more intercessors. Come pray for them. We want to pray for healing this morning. Yeah, I had a word real similar to that. Uh, you actually have screws or, or metal in, in, in your body, and bones, and uh, they cause you pain. Uh, come forward and get, get prayer for, for that. Okay, I'm going to come to the back door, and if you're a guest, I'd love for you to greet me. Let me bless you and release you. May the Lord bless us and keep us and make his face, his face, shine on us. And may he be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance on us that we will go out of here in peace. Shalom in Jesus' name. God bless you, church.
For from you are all things, to you are all 